This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites to online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready for launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Alexander the Great stood at the head of the world's most feared army, using it to carve for himself an absolutely vast empire. He crushed the Persian Empire and then thrust his way into Egypt and India to become the acknowledged king of kings. Then, at the height of his power, he was cut down, leaving behind a legacy of heroism, divinity, and tyranny. In today's biographics, we examine the incredible life of Alexander. The future Alexander the Great was born in Pella, Macedonia, the capital of ancient Greece. Because the Greeks used a different calendar than we do, we can't actually say for certainty when exactly he was born. Most historians believe that he was born on July the 20th, 356 BCE. He was the son of the king of Macedon, Philip II, and the principal one of his seven wives, Olympias of Epirus. As the son of the king, Alexander, he was raised by a nurse. He had private tutors, with the first one being a relative by the name of Leonidas. This man was a strict teacher who demanded a high level of academic rigor of the young prince. Leonidas schooled Alexander in such subjects as maths, reading, and languages. At around the age of seven, Alexander started instruction under one of his father's generals, a man by the name of Lysimachus of Archanania. His job was to teach the boy to behave like a noble. Alexander was taught to play the lyre as well as to ride and to hunt. Lysimachus Marcus also gave him instruction in fighting. When he was 10 years old, Alexander's father was presented with a horse for sale by a trader. But the horse, it was wild, and no one could mount it. Philip was about to dismiss this trader when young Alexander stepped forward and said that he was able to tame the animal. The boy set himself to breaking the animal and becoming its master. This was a dangerous task even for a grown man, but young Alexander showed impressive determination and perseverance to conquer this horse. His father, the king, was so proud of his son that he even gave way to tears. He told his son, my boy, you must find a kingdom big enough for your ambitions. Macedon is too small for you. After saying this, he purchased the horse for him. He named the horse Bucephalus, which means oxhead. He rode the horse over most of his career, and he carried it with him into many battles. When Bucephalus died of old age at 30, Alexander, he named a city after him. When he was 13, Alexander's education was taken to a new level when Philip employed the greatest philosopher of the day, Aristotle, to tutor his son. The daily lessons were held at the Temple of Nymphs at Mieza. Alexander lived there with other royal children in a sort of very privileged version of a boarding school. Some of the teenagers that Alexander associated with at that time would later become his generals. Aristotle provided instruction in religion, morals, philosophy, art, and logic. In appreciation for the education that he was providing for his son, the king rebuilt Aristotle's home in the town of Stagira. This had previously been destroyed by the same king. He also purchased every slave in the town and freed them. When he reached the age of 16, Alexander was handed a huge responsibility. His father had just declared war on Byzantium, and he was about to lead his army into battle. He left the capital city of Macedon under the control of Alexander. It was a huge display of trust on behalf of the king, but others soon took advantage. A group of European tribes, known as the Thracian Medi, rose up in rebellion under the impression that the kingdom was weakened under the teenage prince. But Alexander, he was up to the challenge. He sent his army in, and the Thracians were quickly driven out of their territory. He had the area repopulated with Greeks and renamed it Alexandropolis. When King Philip returned from battle, he was extremely impressed with the way that his son had dealt with the Thracian revolt. He gave Alexander his own small army and the job of stomping out any minor revolts that cropped up throughout the empire. Over the next three years, Alexander joined his father on a number of military campaigns to dominate the Greek states. On one occasion, it was claimed that Alexander saved his father's life during a campaign against the Greek state of Perinthus. They defeated the cities of Elatia and Amphissa. Then they came up against the united armies of Athens and Thebes. The armies met during an epic battle near Chaeronea in Boeotia. Philip took the right wing of the army and put the left wing under Alexander, with Macedonia's top generals having to answer to him. The Thebes and Athenians were defeated, giving Philip control of the majority of the Greek states. He then set about uniting them into a Hellenic alliance.
Having stamped his dominance on a largely united Greece, Philip set his sights on conquering Persia. This time he left his son in control of a hugely expanded empire. When he returned, Philip added an extra wife to his household. Her name was Cleopatra Eurydice. This marriage put Alexander's position as heir to the throne in danger. Cleopatra was a full Macedonian, while Alexander was only half Macedonian. This meant that if Cleopatra had a son, this one would supersede Alexander in the line of succession. During the wedding feast, Attalus, the uncle of Cleopatra, who was one of Philip's top generals, was heard to drunkenly request of the gods that the king and his new bride should quickly produce a son. Alexander heard the plea, and he was not happy. He went up to the general and threw a cup at his head and said, You villain! What am I then? A bastard? Alexander felt abandoned by his father. After the wedding, he and his mother left Macedon and headed for Epirus, where a mother's brother, King Alexander I, resided. Leaving his mother there, he continued on to Illyria in the western part of the Balkan Peninsula. He was welcomed as a visiting dignitary by the Illyrian king. Back in Macedon, the king was saddened by his son's departure. He sent a messenger to persuade Alex to return. The reality was that Philip had never intended to displace Alexander as heir. However, shortly after Alexander's return to Macedon, there was more tension between the two. Philip arranged for Alexander's younger brother, also called Philip, to marry. Alexander's troublemaking friends persuaded him that the king was again trying to cut him off from inheriting the throne. However, when Philip heard of the rumors, he angrily banished the troublemakers. In October of 336 BC, the Macedonian royal court was in Aegi for the wedding of Alexander I of Epirus and Alexander's sister, Cleopatra of Macedon. Philip was assassinated by one of his bodyguards as he entered into the town's theater. The reasons for the assassination are unclear, but the result was very clear. 20-year-old Alexander was now king of Macedonia. Alexander was shaken by his father's murder. He knew that the plotters were intent on stealing the throne out from under him. If he didn't take decisive action, he too would soon be dead. He began by having his cousin, Amin is the fourth put to death, along with a pair of Macedonian princes from Lysenetus. He also ordered the execution of Attalus, the uncle of his stepmother Cleopatra. His mother, Olympias, saw danger in the form of Cleopatra, the woman who had married Philip a few years earlier. She arranged for Cleopatra and the daughter she had had with Philip to be killed. She also poisoned others, leaving some of them mentally and physically disabled for life. Alexander was furious at his mother for poisoning his half-sister, who he didn't consider to be a threat to him. When the news that the stable, dominant rule of Philip had been replaced Placed by his 20-year-old son, a number of states were emboldened to rise up in revolt. Recently conquered states, including Athens and Thessalonica, attempted to reassert their independence. Despite his advisers urging a diplomatic response, Alexander was determined to stamp his dominance on the rebellious states. He personally led a force of 3,000 soldiers to sort things out. In many cases, the uncooperative state's resistance evaporated at the sight of Alexander at the head of his army. Those who didn't were put down very swiftly. He rode through the various states that his father had united. Alexander, he was heaped with praise. His swift action had cemented his power and provided a seamless transition from his father's rule to his. Having put down a series of revolts, Alexander wanted to ensure that there were no further uprisings. In his second year as king, he took his army east and defeated the Thracian people who had rebelled against him four years ago. He also conquered the Trebali tribe. By now, Alexander's Macedonian kingdom it had become so large that if he went north to put down a rebellion, people in the south would rise up. Then, when he went south, those in the north would rebel again. What was needed was a show of dominance that would prevent further uprisings. With the northern states brought under control, Alexander took his army south. He went directly to Thebes, the only southern state which had dared to rebel. Alexander he was keen to make an example of them. The city it was completely destroyed. He then created a series of smaller cities that were populated with people from other areas. This assault, it had finally brought all of Greece under Alexander's dominion. He now set out to conquer Asia. To keep the home kingdom under control, he put a general by the name of Antipater in charge with a sizable army. <laughs> In 334 BCE, Alexander marched a 40,000-strong army out of Macedonia. He was focused on taking possession of the entire Persian Empire, which he considered to be a personal gift to him from the gods. Unlike his father, Alexander was never really interested in achieving diplomatic negotiations. He was all about taking what he wanted by a force of arms. The first resistance that the Macedonian army found as they swept into Persia was at the Battle of Granicus River. This river was a formidable obstacle that the Greek army would have to cross. The Persians, under the Memnon of Rhodes, positioned themselves around the river in order to await the arrival of the enemy. Their strength was a little over half of that of the Greeks. 
Alexander led his army into a direct frontal attack, using a classic wedge-shaped assault. They drove into the middle of the Persian line. In the melee that followed, it was reported that Alexander personally killed several Persians. He was almost felled with an axe blow, but he was able to recover and save himself. The superior numbers of the Greeks, combined with their use of the lance to counter the javelin attacks of the Persians, eventually won the day. The Persians, they were defeated and chased from the field. Total Persian casualties were around 4,000, with Alexander's army having lost a tenth of that number. There had been about 18,000 Greek mercenaries who had fought for the Persians in this battle. They were captured by the Greek army. Alexander considered these men to be traitors to their country and deserving of no mercy. He had half of them executed and the rest taken as slaves. Following this victory, Alexander took possession of Sardis, the provincial capital of the Kingdom of Lydia. He then traveled down the Ionian coast. Most towns welcomed him as a conqueror, and he duly declared that they were free of their Persian overlords and able to rule themselves as autonomous states. As he moved down the coast, the Persian navy was constantly trying to engage Alexander in battle. However, he resisted, preferring to fight on the land. Moving south, Alexander came to Halicarnassus, where he engaged in his first full-scale siege operation. The Persian fleet had sailed to the port of Halicarnassus, where it set up a base. Prior to Alexander's arrival, the queen of Halicarnassus, Ada of Caria, had been driven from the city and replaced by a satrap named Orontobates. Ada had set herself up in the fortress of Alinda. When Alexander rode in, she surrendered the fort to him. The defenders of the city of Halicarnassus now set up to defend the city. Still, Alexander's army it managed to break through the city walls. However, they were driven back by the catapults from within the city. A renewed assault overcame this peril and stormed through a second time. Memnon of Rhodes, who was in defense of the city, having evaded capture at Granicus River, set the city on fire before retreating. The Persian fleet they also withdrew. Alexander formally returned the city to Queen Ada. In return, she adopted him as a son, therefore making sure that the city would pass to him on her death. So look, you might not be out there conquering the world, but if you want to conquer the internet for yourself, your brand, and your business, why well, should do it with Squarespace? See what I did there? Pretty good transition, right? Squarespace, it empowers dreamers, makers, and doers like Alexander the Great. If he was around today, he'd be using Squarespace. It gives people the tools to bring their creative ideas to life. Squarespace makes it easy too. They have an all-in-one platform so you can claim a domain, build a website, and even sell online. There's no fussing around getting a domain from one place and bringing it over to another, then working out how to sell something or whatever. It's all just done neat and tidily on Squarespace. That's pretty nice. Plus, it's not going to look too shabby either. And by not too shabby, I mean it's going to look pretty fantastic. They've got award-winning templates, which is a perfect starting point. Then you then just customize those templates until your heart's content and it looks just how you want it. They've also got 24-7 customer support by chat or email. And they've also got loads of accessible and not confusing documentation on how to make a great website. Plus, email marketing so you can keep in touch with your fans or your customers. Look. Squarespace, it makes it easy. So get that domain, get that site built, get up a shop if you want to, and you're good to go. Just head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to go launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Let's get back to Alexander and his conquering of the world. Control of Halicarnassus and the coastal cities meant that the Persians could no longer dock their fleet. Continuing on his conquest, Alexander arrived at the Phrygian capital of Gordium. It was here, according to Greek legend, that he was taken before a famed ox cart which was tied with an incredibly complicated rope knot known as the Gordian Knot. It was said that whoever could undo the knot would become ruler of Asia. Alexander is said to have examined the knot closely, then, having no idea how to undo it, he pulled out his sword and cut the rope in half with a single stroke. We don't know whether the story is true, but, you know, it makes for a good tale. Continuing south, Alexander's army encountered, for the first time, a more formidable army than his own. It was under the leadership of Darius III, king of the Archaemenid Empire of Persia. Despite being outnumbered, Alexander's tactical skill and his personal bravery in leading from the front, they won the day. Darius, he was completely overwhelmed by this loss. He took to his heels before leaving his army a great treasure and all of his kingdom. Alexander claimed it all. With the absolute dominance of Alexander's Greek army over the Persians, bordering nations began to panic. The all-conquering warrior king had developed an aura of invincibility, and many nations simply acceded to him as he entered their territory. 
By 332, he had taken Syria and the coast of the Levant. He then set about taking Tyre, which was a coastal island bay sitting about a mile out in the Mediterranean Sea. Conquering the island would be a great challenge to Alexander, with the combination of the sea and high walls that surrounded the island, leaving him with very few options. For seven months, Alexander blockaded the island, preventing either entry or exit. He then had his army build a causeway out of rocks in order to allow them to get to the city walls. When the city walls were eventually breached, Alexander was so angry with the extended Tyrian holdout that, according to contemporary historian Arian of Nicomedia, he ordered the massacre of up to 8,000 citizens. Following the taking of Tyre, most of the cities on Alexander's campaign route surrendered without putting up any resistance. The only one city that stood firm as he wound his way to Egypt was Gaza. As this city sat atop a hill, it looked as if Alexander was in for another protracted siege. Yet this was one siege that sort of looked like an impossibility. The walls were, according to Alexander's engineers, too high and too thick to be penetrated. For Alexander, though, this was just the sort of challenge that got his juices flowing. He became even more determined to conquer the city. He was convinced that destiny was going to find a way for him. The Greek army made three desperate attempts to breach the walls. Eventually, on the final day, they made that breakthrough. But the cost? It was terrific, with thousands of men falling to the missiles of the enemy. Alexander himself suffered a serious shoulder wound. Once the city was taken, severe punishment was exacted upon the inhabitants, with the men being slaughtered and the women and children being sold into slavery. When the all-conquering Greek army approached the holy Jewish city of Jerusalem, the Jews threw open the gates and welcomed him into their midst. It was reported that Alexander was taken into the great temple of Solomon and shown a prophetic text from the book of Daniel that referred to him as a mighty king who would conquer the land. Alexander left Jerusalem in peace and headed south to lay claim to Egypt. In that land, he was welcomed as a liberator. The people proclaimed him to be a son of the gods and gave him reverence on the same level as their own pharaoh. He founded the city of Alexandria, which would become a major trading center in future times. Leaving Egypt, Alexander traveled back north as he set his sights on taking Babylon. This is the Persian capital where King Darius had positioned himself. Alexander marched with 47,000 men, but Darius had amassed a massive army, which some historians have put at one million men. The two armies met near the village of Gregamela. At the forefront of his lines, Darius placed chariots armed with scythes and 15 elephants in an attempt to mow through the Greek lines. In response, Alexander placed his light troops up front to negate the effects of the chariots with missiles directed at their horses. Those chariots that made it to the Greek line were allowed to pass harmlessly through where they were surrounded and captured. Darius himself was in a scythe-armed chariot, but when his charioteer was felled by a javelin, he jumped from the chariot, mounted a horse, and fled. Seeing this, many of his own men they followed suit. Panic ensued, and the battle was over. Following the conquest of Babylon, Alexander moved on to Susa and then to the Persian city of Persepolis. He then determined to hunt down and kill Darius, the disgraced Persian king, in order to prevent any further reprisals. He finally found Darius, but he had already been killed. One of his most trusted men, Bessus, had killed him and now claimed the throne for himself. Alexander now set his sights on tracking down Bessus, who had fled into Central Asia. Alexander explored much of Asia. He found a number of cities, naming each of them in his own honor. Eventually, Bessus was betrayed by his own men and handed over for execution. On his return to Persia, Alexander he was hailed as the king of kings. He began to adopt Persian habits, including dressing in Persian clothing and following Persian customs. This was troubling to many Greeks, including some of his generals. By now, Alexander had been away from Macedon for many years. He had left Antipater as the military ruler of the city, and he had effectively maintained the peace. However, Alexander was obstinately requesting troop reinforcements, which made the defenses of the city weaker. Alexander now set his sights on conquering the Indian subcontinent. He sent delegates ahead of him to demand that the Indian leaders submit to him. Some of the clans acquiesced, but others didn't. These clans would be furiously attacked by Alexander's army. Complete villages, they were burned to the ground, and people were killed with impunity. The Greek army met their strongest resistance at the hands of King Porus in the Punjab region. The Indian forces were defeated in battle, but Alexander was so impressed with the tactics and bravery of Porus that he offered a co-rulership to him. While Alexander would control the land, he would hand the day-to-day -day running of Punjab to Porus. By now, Alexander had conquered more territory than any other ruler in history. But he was still not satisfied. He wanted to advance even deeper into the Indian subcontinent. However, his army 
they didn't. They had simply had enough. The soldiers revolted, refusing to advance any further. The generals sided with them, and one of them, General Conus, told Alexander that the men longed to again see their parents, their wives, their children, their homeland. Alexander sympathized and decided that it was time to go home. But he continued to conquer villages and claim more land on his return route. In order to placate his men, he sent older and disabled soldiers directly back to Macedonia. But this act it backfired. The men thought that they were all going directly home. When Alexander marched then on further conquests, there was a lot of anger. The men of his army they began to openly criticize Alexander. They were especially unhappy with his adoption of Persian customs and the appointing of Persian officers to command them. In an attempt to win favor, Alexander ensured the Macedonian troops were ruled over by Macedonian officers. He also held a huge banquet for his men to celebrate the years of victory. After returning to Persia, Alexander established himself in the great palace of Nebuchadnezzar. He planned further campaigns of conquest into Arabia, but these would never come to pass. Alexander died suddenly on June 10th or 11th, 332 BCE. The cause of death is unclear, with there being two main theories. And both of these theories involve the excessive use of alcohol. In one account, he developed a fever after a 24-hour drinking binge. In the other, he became sick after drinking a bowl of unmixed wine. Of course, there's also been talk of poisoning. The death of the King of Kings at the height of his power was a huge shock to the entire world. People could not believe that such a strong, dynamic, and heroic individual could be struck down without warning. Alexander's body was placed in a gold sarcophagus. After much disputing, he was laid to rest in Alexandria. Over the next centuries, many famous leaders came to pay respects. But his body it was not left in peace. It is said that the Roman Emperor Augustus accidentally damaged the corpse and Caligula stole Alexander's breastplate. Such incidents prompted Emperor Septimius Severus to close the tomb to the public in 200 CE. Where it was taken is unknown. Today, the location of Alexander's tomb is one of history's great mysteries. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. Also, please do check out our sponsor, Squarespace. Like I said, they're what Alexander the Great would have used. You'll find a link to them below. And as always, thank you for watching.